order. And before we begin, I would like to read a statement. Pursuant to board policy 1B.5, all meetings of the Salisbury Township School District are audio and video recorded. And with that, would everyone rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic, and for the nation, under God, and the and the God and the and the liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Chili's like an echo. It is like a step behind. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Nickasher, could I please have a roll call? Yes. Mr. DeFrank? Mr. Freeze? Here. Mrs. Glenister? Here. Mr. Ganahl? Here. Mrs. Klinger? Here. Mr. Cuzo? Here. Mrs. <clears throat> McKelvey? Here. Mrs. Nemitz? Here. Mr. Spinner? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we have no special recognition, recognitions or presentations tonight, so we're going to move on to the student representative's report. And we'll begin tonight with the high school, and I would like Olivia Cudd and Michael Warder to come forward, please. Mick Warder, sorry. Thank you. We do want to get the names right. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Olivia Cudd. Um, I go by Livy. I'm a freshman at Salisbury High School. Uh, and I am Michael McWhorter, and I am also a freshman at Salisbury High School. I'm the coolest freshman in the West. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Well, it's nice to be able to report to you today. Um, so here are the um, new updates on what's happening at SHS. Uh, winter sports, they're coming to an end. Boys and girls basketball, they had their final games last night. Uh, so that was pretty exciting. I was there for part of the girls one. It was interesting. So SHS is also hosting the annual dual, dual wrestling tournament this weekend, and we have some members of the team who qualify for, dix, for districts later this month. So congratulations to them. Swimming had their senior night tonight. They have a few more meets remaining for the regular season, and a few Falcons have already qualified for districts. That's exciting. And there is still time in these meets to qualify for even more. So let's go. <laughs> and we also have a lot of spring sports coming up. There are interest meetings that are being hosted. And most of the practices, they start on March 6th. And there are also free physicals for spring sports. And they're being offered at SHS as well. And um, those start on February 21st. And um, they, if they have any questions or concerns, they should email Ms. Pinella or Ms. Deeb, our athletic directors, for more information. Uh, last Thursday, Salisbury High School hosted the third LVDIA or LVIDA regular season tournament for debate. It was a rather significant event as it involved nine schools and nearly 100 students competing. Uh, Salisbury High School teachers hosted debates in their classrooms while some even judged the debates themselves. Uh, and, and other students of Salisbury High School were timekeepers and guides for other students that were visiting. Uh, and even more students were in the audience for the debates. Salisbury finished 7-1 and one for that day, which could, puts us at second place overall, tied with... Um I forgot what we're tied with, never mind. Uh, <laughs> the final full team tournament will take place tomorrow at Caddy. I am on the debate team, wish me luck, we're gonna win. Um, also, uh, Salisbury Model UN team, they held an in-house an in crisis simulation today and delegates worked on a historic, worked in a historic committee to try to obtain better outcomes during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Model UN is also excited to be sending delegates to Cornell's Model UN conference in April, so. 
the Model UN thing was a lot of fun. I was there. Uh, the senior breakfast was held last week. Uh, students watched the senior video, received gift bags with a t-shirt, and had lots of time to hang out and eat. I heard it was pretty cool. So we also have um, Sewing for Charity, a club at Salisbury. Um, so they're holding a Valentine's sale. So that sale goes from February 8th to February 15th. Um, and, so, and it's for personally made stuffed bears and sweetheart scrunchies. And all proceeds from the sale will benefit homeless families and students in our district. Reach out to Ms. Borthwick if you are interested. Also, I looked at a lot of those stuffed animals and they are adorable, so. <laughs> They really are. I saw them as well. <laughs> Spanish Club has been selling bracelets, keychains, and lanyards until Valentine's Day to celebrate love and friendship for Dia del Amor y Amistad, a uh, Spanish holiday. Uh, sales should be taking place during all lunches, and there's something for everyone, so you should buy if you're there. Uh, or maybe make your kids buy you something. Who knows? Uh, uh, prices range from 2 to $5 per item. Half of the proceeds will be donated back to the people that make the product in the Philippines of a uh, former Spanish colony. So please contact Ms. Dos Santos with any questions. Um, so the class of 2026, the advisory is holding a fundraiser with Gertrude Hawk, and that goes through the end of February. Um, we are part of class advisory, so we helped kind of start it. Um, so if any of the students are interested, um, make sure for them to see a member of the class of 2026 or Mrs. Salaby, our class advisor, if they are interested in purchasing. You should reach out. Those are some pretty good chocolates and we also got to raise some money for our class. So, you know, stay on that grind set. Uh, let's uh, STARS is asking for donations for homeless care kits that will be put together for the 6th Street, 6th Street Alliance. February is the month of love and friendship, and we want to take care of those in need. Some teachers are also offering extra credit for donations, so the do and the donations drive will end on February 16th. Get those grades up by helping the homeless. So it is also um, National School Counselors Week. So thank you, Ms. Moyer and Mr. Anderson, our high school guidance counselors, for all that you do. We really appreciate you. They do, in fact, do a lot. I, we should appreciate them more. Uh, the Salisbury High School Spring Theater Musical 9 to 5 will take place at the Salisbury High School Auditorium March 16th through March 18th at 7 p.m and Sunday, March 19th at 2 p.m. Tickets are on sale for $10 per person, and tickets may be purchased in advance online or at the door. Cash, checks uh, made payable to Salisbury Theater or credit cards will be accepted at the door. For any questions, please contact Ms. Pinella or Mrs. Deeb. Uh, you should come see the musical. We're both in it. It's coming out pretty great. You should, I'd absolutely recommend. Yep, make sure to go see it. We all love an audience for, <laughs> for that stuff. <laughs> um, so finally, Salisbury Township School District um, Wellness Committee is organizing a, communi a community 5K fun run to be held on sa Saturday, April 22nd. And its location will be um, at SHS or at or Salisbury Elementary School and the surrounding neighborhoods. So more information is to follow up as we approach, as the time comes closer. So thank you all for coming today and we hope you have a great night. <laughs> thank you all for inflating my ego by laughing at my jokes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can we have them back sometime? Yeah. I, <laughs> I think that was pretty awesome. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to mention one thing to the board. I love that our high school has so many like clubs and activities available to our kids. I know a lot of those are available during Falcon period during the day, but um, I think it's important for the board to know that Model UN and debate, they meet before school. And scholastic scrimmage. And scholastic scrimmage too, but their season has sadly come to an end. Yeah. So it's, it's just an extra commitment to, uh, you know, on behalf of the students and the parents to get there. I think debate starts at 640 multiple days a week and Model UN starts at 7. So that, that's the part I don't miss of driving. <laughs> <laughs> don't miss that. 
Yeah. <laughs> also throw a plug in there for uh, wrestling. We'll be hosting Nazareth too. But great job tonight, guys. Yeah. Real nice job. Thank you. Thank you also to the committed staff members who are providing those activities. We really appreciate um, leveraging our teachers' passions and interests to provide opportunities for kids. And um, it's a big commitment on, on both sides, so thank you. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the middle school, Peyton Kao and Gia Olds. Hi, my name is Gia Olds, and I'm in student council at the middle school. Hi, my name is Peyton Kao, and I'm also in middle, the middle school. We would like to share some things that's going on in the middle school. Next Wednesday, our eighth grade class will be heading to Blue Mountain for their final day of the Shred Education program. Students will be using what they've learned to try their hand at skiing or snowboarding. This is a great free opportunity that Blue Mountain provides to eighth graders in our area. Next Thursday, our sixth graders will head to Blue Mountain to take part in their Science of Sliding program. The Science of Sliding program is aligned to our sixth grade science standards and provides a fun, interactive learning experience for our students. It focuses on forces of motion and requires students to collect data and velocity, potential, and kinetic energy. In addition, Songfest at Nazareth will be held on February 16th, and Bandfest will be held on March 10th. This is a huge honor for kids in the music program. Mrs. Mosley will be guiding her students as they learn six pieces of music. The students will perform these songs with other 7th and 8th grade musicians from 31 different schools, including Carbon, Lehigh, Northampton, Schuylkill, and Monroe counties. 110 students will participate in Bandfest, and 185 will participate in Songfest. In seventh, in seventh grade, students will be taking a field trip to the Da Vinci Science Center on February 23rd. There's a special exhibit that di different systems of the bodies. We also get to a lab dissecting the human body where we get to perform surgery on a fake body. <laughs> SMS will be hosting a winter semi-formal on Friday, February 24th. This is organized by the Interact Club. This event will be for seventh and eighth grade only. All funds from the dance will go to Sites for Hope, which is an organization that works with kids who are blind or visually impaired. In addition to the Da Vinci field trip, the, science, the seventh graders will head to Cutstown University on March 9th. And when we get there, we're going to look at the planetarium. When we're done, <clears throat> that we, we will be divided into small groups to either learn about other topics related to science or vis visit the art-related science section of our building. Thank you for taking the time to listen to some updates about our middle school. Have a great night. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the elementary school, school Sophia Butler and Cashin Chismar. That looks good. Okay. Good evening. My name is Cashin Chismar. And mine is Sophia Butler. We are both in third grade. Kindergarten registration is open for the 2023 to 24 school year. Families can enroll using our new online enrollment form that can be found on our website. January 24th, we held our Leader and Me family, game, fam, Leader and Me family Night and Game Night for families. Leader and Me Certification Training Part 1 att attends participated in activities to learn more about habits 1 through 4 and how to implement these leadership practices at home with their families. This, in, this event was led by teachers. The PTO provided snacks and drinks for families in attendance and childcare was also provided for our families. Part two of the training series will occur on Tuesday, March 21st from 5.30 to 6.30. Game night was held at SES following the Leader and Me event. Families joined in the fun by playing games like Uno, Minute to Win It, Bingo, Connect Four, Trash, Pictionary, Jenga, and LA and Book It. After these, after these, after games, families were invited to the cafeteria to enjoy hot dogs and pizza, which was, which was followed by a basket raffle to award board games to individuals and attendants. February 6th was Falcon Proud Day. Staff and students wear their Salisbury gear on this day. Upcoming events. February 10th is Teacher Day. February 13th, wear your favorite sports team attire. February 
14th Valentine's parties, February 17th to 20th, schools closed, February 25th, PTO family movie night, February 27th, March 3rd, Dr. Seuss and Read Across American Week. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Um, I don't see why any kids wouldn't love to come to school yeah. because there's all these other things to do besides learn, but they're <laughs> all part of learning. It's, it's uh, motivational. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on. We can, um, we can give them a, a, a moment if they, they want to exit, right? If they, absolutely. Yes, and on your way out, thanks for joining us tonight. You're welcome to grab a cup or a hat there if you'd like. Thanks to the parents and guardians who uh, made the trip out as well. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> There's none left on this side. Oh, absolutely. Oh, like I didn't even, I didn't know about the science of slide. I think that's just really cool. <laughs> okay. We'll move on to the educational part. <laughs> it's all educational. It's all educational. <laughs> they learn something from everything that they do in school. Uh, we're going to start with the Keystone data portion, and um, Ms. Morningstar will take us through that. So I wanted to start. Thank you. First of all, we're glad you're here. As am I, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to start by trying to explain some of the differences. Uh, could you advance that, please? Um, talking to you a little bit about what the Keystone exams are and then explaining some of the differences between the Keystone exams and the PSSAs, because there are several, and some of those differences affect the numbers that you may see printed or how those are reported. So Keystone exams, when they were developed, the goal was to replace the grade 11 PSSAs. The intention at that time was um, we started first with math and literature, Algebra 1 and literature. Uh, the next year we introduced biology, and then the intention was that there would also be a social studies PSSA or Keystone, which has never come to fruition. So I'm not really sure where that stands at this point. Um, the Keystones represent one component of Pennsylvania's graduation um, requirement for students. Uh, the pathways that we've talked about repeatedly, the five graduation pathways, three of those relate to Keystones. So you um, can be proficient in all of those, uh, proficient or advanced in all of those, on all of those tests you can achieve a composite score on the three tests, or your proficient or advanced can count um, in the next column as well, which would be um, uh, alternate assessments. So they are end of course assessments. They're taken at the end of Algebra one or its equivalent, 10th uh, grade by, or English, 10th grade literature, and biology, which for most of our students occurs in ninth grade. They are taken at the end of the course regardless of the grade the student is in. This is particularly applicable in math because students take a different math sequence. So in, in any given year, we have eighth graders taking a keystone because they finish, they're finishing algebra one at the middle school, ninth graders and 10th graders, and sometimes even 11th graders taking the keystone for the first time, okay? Each keystone consists of two modules, and each module is scored independent of the other. Teachers do receive a breakdown uh, regarding the achievement on each of those modules. Those modules become important because if we skip to the bottom, you'll see that there's a reference to a super score. Uh, those of you familiar with uh, the SATs will remember what a super score is. It takes your highest portion from different tests and combines them. You can do a super score with keystones as well. So if you take um, a keystone at the end of 10th grade and you're proficient on your first module, but you're basic on your second module, but then you retest the following winter and you're proficient on your second module, you can combine those two proficient scores and pass. 
if that makes sense. Uh, keystones can be taken and are taken by our students multiple times until or um, in every attempt to achieve proficiency. We do stop biology um, once they're two years out because it is so content specific that once they're two years removed from the content of the class, it's pretty difficult to recall that. Uh, can you go back? I think I might have missed oh, something there. Nope. Uh, oh, it's banked. So your highest module score is banked until the end of your junior year. The end of the junior year is when the picture is taken. And that picture is the last time you take your keystones. It takes pictures of your highest scores, and that's your snapshot as a student. And when we talk about the Act 158 tracking that we have to do, I think you can understand why it's complex. And when we're doing it by, um, you know, people power <laughs> and going through, even making sure you know which module and mm -hmm. it's very time intensive. So that's part of the reason why we've been looking at some solutions. So I just thought I'd kind of make that connection while we're here. Right. For one student, I mean, there's the potential that you're looking at four to five test administrations, depending upon how many times they retested. So you may have to look back at 15 different tests to see where their highest scores were. So it can become really laborious. And it's also offered multiple times. So we have, we, it's not just one administration, you know what I mean? It, it's, you're looking at different test windows and they may have taken one, but not the other. And when you're going through all of these scores. Right, we do our end of course administration always occurs in the spring and we offer retests in December and then again in the spring when first time testers are also testing. Okay. A couple of differences that I think are important to highlight between the Keystone exams and the PSSAs. Keystones can be retaken multiple times. PSSAs are not. Um, you take the PSSA one time and that's the score you get. So if you think about that from this perspective, it's really easy to report a third grade math score because they all took it at the same time. You look at all of those scores. There's a nice, neat picture, and you can give a percent proficient. When you start talking about something like Algebra 1, if you want a picture of a certain class, so let's say you want to know the proficiency for the class of 2023, you're going to have to look at test administrations that start as far back as when that class of 2023 was in ninth grade. So you have to look at the ninth grade spring administration, 10th grade winter and spring, 11th grade winter and spring to see, uh, to actually come up with what your percentage proficiency is. That is not what the newspapers print. They print what any test administration in a given year shows. Right, and for math, you're going back to eighth grade because we have eighth graders taking the algebra. I'm sorry, that's, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, a key, as I said, keystones aren't necessarily, back it up please, aren't necessarily grade specific. Pause. They're taken, <laughs> I'm bossy. <laughs> They're taken uh, the first time. Whenever the student finishes the course, regardless of what it is, uh, they fulfill in part three of the five different graduation pathways for Act 158 and then the retesting schedule. So, ooh, you're going to test my eyesight here. So, <laughs> so if we look, can you make it a little bigger, Kelly? If we look at the um, Future Ready Index, this is what's actually, so I'll just look up here. This is what's actually reported on the Future Ready site. And these are, um, so these were the tests administered last year. So, thank you. So when you look at the proficiencies being reported, those are the reports of the proficiencies from last year's test. That doesn't necessarily encapsulate last, the students who, are gradu who graduated in 21-22 or in 22-23. That includes anyone who tested. What's important to remember is when those numbers look low, we may or may not have a lot of retesters. So, um, you know, we see, we see a significant decrease um, in proficiency after the first test administration. There are often students who struggle uh, with that content, many times students who have diagnosed learning disabilities in the content, um, you will see that our PVAS data shows that our learning support students make tremendous growth in a year's time, but it's often not enough to achieve proficiency, okay? So <laughs> this is where I had to go back and look at the last five years of testing uh, to show you what a snapshot would look, would look like for the class of 2023. Um, so you'll notice that the percent um, proficient or advanced on this 
is uh, just a little over 45, 46%. Um, and that is for Algebra 1. Can you advance that, Kelly? Uh, the biology, this one's artificially high, and let me tell you why. <laughs> um, students had the option in when the class of 2023, when they were in ninth grade, they didn't have to take the Keystone. They could take a proficiency, um, and that was part of the um, uh, plan because of COVID. So students didn't necessarily have to take biology, and because our students take it in ninth grade, they fell into this group, okay? We did still have a number of students who did take it, though. And uh, literature proficiency, you'll see, is uh, just slightly over 67% proficient. So those numbers look significantly better than what you see necessarily reported either in the paper or on the Future Ready site, because those are looking at the students who test and then retest and sometimes retest again until they achieve proficiency. Okay. This is the PVAS data that I was mentioning to you in terms of how our students do um, measure in gaining, a, making a year's growth in one year's time. We have a significantly higher than um, average percentage of students who make more than a year's growth in a year's time. So they are making gains, um, significant gains. It's not always enough. You know, if a student's five years behind, gaining two grade levels in a year still won't bring you to proficiency, but that's a lot of learning that occurs <coughs> in a year's time. Particularly, we see a lot of growth with our students who are part of our um, Read 180 program um, in terms of their reading comprehension skills. Okay. What, what do we do with the data? <laughs> so we share the data with all staff um, and make sure that they know what the snapshot or the overall picture is and provide PVAS and e-metric training for department chairs and then opportunities uh, for the department chairs to also engage in professional learning with our inter intermediate unit to delve deeper into that as well. Um, additionally, I monitor the career readiness and graduation pathways along with our guidance department to make sure that Every student is meeting a graduation pathway, um, and then to make sure that the next class is already starting to meet their graduation pathway. So we've developed spreadsheets which are functional, um, but they make it, tracking is difficult without a, a system in place to do so. Um, in terms of what that data actually tells us, our students are doing generally well once the retakes are calculated in. So you have to look at the first time testers and the retesters to see overall proficiency before they graduate. And overall, they're doing quite well. 100% of our students met their career readiness standards last year. Our goal is to meet that same goal this year. Our four and five year uh, cohort graduation rates are better than the states, but you will notice that it's decreased. Um, from previous years. One of the reasons we see a dip in our four-year graduation rate is we have, um, by virtue of primarily our transitional learning support program, but also other students involved in project search or special education programming, kids come back for more than four years. They stay until they're 19, 21 in many cases um, to pursue the vocational training that they need. Um, which is absolutely appropriate for them, but that doesn't reflect, you know, that, that's a ding against your four-year and your five-year graduation rate uh, because they aren't leaving school in four or five years. In a school our size, each student counts just under a percentage point. So, you know, you have five students who are continuing as 12-plus students, it will lower our graduation rate, and frankly, that's okay because that's what they need. Um, our areas of challenge, our economically disadvantaged students are underperforming. Um, when we drill down and look at the student body, one of the things we're seeing is we have a significant increase in our transient population at the high school. I'm probably in the district. Um, and we're seeing that performance um, is linked pretty closely to that. Our kids who have not been part of our school system and who are moving in are often coming in many years behind. Um, and it's difficult to get them caught up. Particularly, you know, we have, I can give you an example that we've had students move in this year on a fifth grade reading level. They're not learning support. 
they're not identified as such, we don't have anything on a fifth grade reading level at the high school. Um, so that's a real challenge, and it's something we're seeing um, more frequently, quite honestly. Uh, we're not meeting our interim goal or our target in math. It's kind of difficult to suss out the root cause of that because our participation rate was affected by COVID um, over multiple years. And when that happens, it's a default proficiency for the kids who were part of that ninth grade group. So I think this is an area we have to watch closely. And I know it is an area that our uh, math department is watching very closely. And I should have deleted that one. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. So our next steps are all of our department chairs are, you know, looking at data that's relevant to their department. So not every department has Keystone data, but the ones that have are certainly including that. In addition to the to the Keystone data, there's also what we call a classroom diagnostic tool. Some of the departments are using, which is a state. It's a free state tool where it gives it gives us some additional data and diagnosing where there are some. Uh, where there's gaps for students. And so we're using that tool. We're also looking at some other tools that we could use um, at the high school. So our department chairs all have an action plan that they're designing with their teams. Um, you know, some of it is grounded in this Keystone data. Some of it's grounded in other things we're seeing that students need, such as executive functioning or social emotional learning or just being able to work together in a group. <laughs> and uh, you know uh, those kinds of things. So all of our departments are actively engaged in looking at the data that's relevant to them and helping to you know kind of brainstorm positive progress on how they can with the resources that we have and the time we have with our kids, you know, how can we make make adjustments to what we're doing? So our departments have been working really hard um, since the beginning of the school year um, to uh, to make those changes. And some of them we're seeing changes now and some of them it's taken, you know, it, it'll be it'll be a longer term, like more things need to happen until we can really kind of see the fruits of that labor. So I, I just wanted to add that as one of the potential, <coughs> potential um, other supports that is happening at the school level with this data. So the departments at the high school meet uh, once a cycle. Once, a, once on a six-day cycle, six Greg, yeah. Um, so this is revisited frequently, I guess is what I'm trying to say. They, they use this data frequently to think about the needs of our students. And if I could just um, sort of piggyback on what you were saying, the CDTs, the classroom diagnostic tools, have proven challenging for our students who are not on grade level um, because they start at a grade level. You know, you're starting on 11th grade content and then it keeps asking questions until it finds where you are. So our lower level students can end up taking a test for two hours. Um, they're exhausted. It's, fatigue sets in. The block ends before many of them finish. And it's just, it's not the right tool to use with students who are already struggling. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at um, other possibilities. Thanks, Heather. Yes. Does anyone have any questions? Just out of curiosity, I know this was just on the high school, but you know, based on benchmark data, I'm not sure what we use for that. But are we finding the drop-off point, you know, specifically in math, where we're where we're missing the mark before they, where we have to get them at, right? Well, we we've made significant curriculum areas. We went all the way back to kindergarten because we felt like the root cause, when I would talk to high school and I would talk to middle school, it would be number sense and understanding place value and that things that were not quite solid in our previous curriculum were going unmet and kind of exacerbating problems that we had. So middle school is probably where it where it shows the most, but when we made changes at the middle school, we didn't see any changes. We had to go, now that we've made changes back to kindergarten, we're starting to see changes. Um, and it, but it's taking, you know, it's taking a while. We're in our third year of our implementation of our um, new math curriculum, which we put into place for K to eight. Um, and, you know, it takes time for teachers to learn it. It takes time for them to get fluid with it. So I would say right now we're kind of, we're, we're, we're trying, to, we're working towards comfortable. And we also, the other gap that we had was with our special education students. We had had a history of using a separate curriculum and then students were moving into a co-taught classroom situation and trying to like move from their previous curriculum, which was not aligned to the PA math 
standards. They had changed. Um, and we were seeing significant problems uh, in that arena. So we've, I feel like we've, we've addressed the key area, the root cause, but um, we, we definitely see a need for more professional development for our staff and um, more opportunities to explore um, to kind of get us even further than we are right now. But I think going back to kindergarten is what we needed to do. Just out of curiosity, because I didn't mean, I, being in education, I know some of the stresses you're going, and I know you're looking at different data systems. Do teachers have accessibility right now to make data-driven decisions based on classroom data for their individual students, or is that getting pushed from district office down to them? No. Um, <laughs> there's nobody to push it down to. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a data, you know. <laughs> I, let me just think about that a minute. Um, that sounds lovely. <laughs> we, um, we changed data systems because our previous uh, benchmarking data didn't allow, it really required someone to hand them a report, which, and, and with the teachers were very, dis, it was very disjointed for them at the elementary level. Um, so we switched, and with FastBridge, the teachers actually all have their own login. They can see their class see all of the changes. They can even do progress monitoring in it. Um, and they're now collecting data uh, for their small group that they're working on. Um, so yes, we and we're actually seeing teachers really reference that data and use it. At the high school level, um, the CDTs, uh, the department chair, because it's, it's very tedious, the department chair generally creates a spreadsheet and shares it. And I would say our math department has the most beautiful spreadsheets you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's color coded. They're they're lovely. They and they make meaningful use of of that of that data. And for us at the high school and the middle school level, like it's one teach. It's generally speaking one teacher, um, with the exception of Project Wonder. Um, but it's one sixth grade math teacher, one seventh grade math teacher. You know, sometimes we'll have two algebra teachers, but. Generally speaking, it's easier to get the data in their hands because they're even if it's not in the most beautiful of formats or not as usable uh, because there's so few of them. You know, they're the ones that are generating it. Um, but we'd really like some other uh, some additional data tools. So, <laughs> and, and the middle school is using IXL this year, so their teachers have access, and um, the liaisons have been supporting and making some decisions directly with them as well. Yeah, and I'd just like to highlight what Ms. Morningstar said about how small our population is. I mean, I know this has been a problem all along with the, like the kids that move in and out. We don't have control of what we did before. We get them, and then their numbers show up in the paper. And I think that's just so mis misleading for us when you you, know, you, pull up this, you type it into your phone and say, oh, that Salisbury's listed as whatever. And I, I'm constantly trying to... You know, that that's what we're, we're up against is that factor. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks for all of your information. Okay, we'll move on to teaching and learning with our building administrators and Kelly. I, th I was gonna say, Heather, I don't know where you're going. <laughs> I got my Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> We'll start with the elementary school. Just a, t I guess, Joe, you gave us a good segue here. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Uh, so we held our data meetings last week uh, with staff where we reviewed our winter benchmark data. Um, we made adjustments into our instructional groups. We did see a lot of growth. Students transitioning from our tier one group into our core group. So. Uh, we were happy to see that students making progress. One of our one of our groups is even looking at um, almost a gifted cohort within the grade level because of the progress that the students have made. Um, now, when I say gifted, I mean um, going above and beyond what normally would occur during that that reading block. This wouldn't necessarily be students who have qualified for gifted instruction, but they're making significant progress um, with this model. Enrichment. Thank you. We also reviewed Sabre's data. Um, so that is information in grades two through four, students complete a self-assessment of their social emotional health. And then students, uh, <coughs> teachers also in kindergarten through fourth grade complete an assessment for each of the students. And then we compare that data 
and make determinations which students qualify for social emotional learning groups. Uh, these would be above and beyond the normal classroom counseling that would occur and very specific uh, for student needs. So it may uh, handle topics like um, uh, loss in a family, uh, divorce, friendship groups, lunch bunches with our counselors. There's also additional groups through um, Center for Humanistic Change as well, where they come into our building, push in, and utilize an area within our, our building to deliver these groups. And at our faculty meeting, um, our, stu our teachers learned about uh, English language learner supports through a guest speaker, Kristen Adams from the IU. So this ties in nicely with our universal design for learning professional development that we also delivered at the beginning of the school year. Uh, this was more specific on how to support our students who are not native uh, language speakers. Kindergarten registration is open. I sent something home to our families at Salisbury uh, Elementary School. Um, this will also be enclosed uh, within the Salisbury Press as well. We have an option now for our students to enroll online. Many of our kindergarten families have chosen to use uh, that process to enroll their students for kindergarten for the 23-24 school year. We also have in-person kindergarten registration for families who are not comfortable uh, completing online registration, and that will occur uh, later this month on February 23rd. We offer a session in the morning and then also a session in the afternoon. Yes. So if you know anyone who has a child that is uh, looking to enroll in kindergarten, please pass that along. And we'd like to thank uh, Mr. Smith, uh, our, he and uh, the enrollment secretaries worked for several months to get our online, our online enrollment process up and running. And uh, we piloted it before kindergarten registration. And we did have a few glitches. <laughs> Apologies to those families who may have had some delays because of our glitches, but we did sort of streamline all of those, work out those glitches for uh, kindergarten enrollment and things seem to be moving along steadily. Um, is the is the online enrollment available in Spanish as well? It's not. Is um, that our on the horizon once we, this is worked out? We hear from Sapphire that that is something that they're working on, okay. but it's not currently available. Our paper enrollment form does have Spanish translation, so we have both of those available. Um, and we did and we did toy with adding a Spanish translation to the online enrollment form. And to be honest, because of the fields and the way it worked, it was quite um, distracting uh, to, to complete it. So we're kind of waiting, hoping that we get a response from Sapphire with an alternative uh, for us to use. And I think the, f but it's not going to happen this year. Like we know it's not happening before June. Um, so we're, our, our fingers are crossed for next school year. And do you have somebody on site, like for the registration, to help parents if they're speaking Spanish or another language? Or we quite frequently have parents who are coming to us at any time in the school year that may need assistance, and they uh, uh, frequently they'll bring someone with them that knows English, or we'll be using Google Translate, or we'll we have a language line that you know is available, or we have f folks on staff who speak Spanish, like Mrs. Kirk, uh, actually is in the back. She's she's called upon occasionally, as are some of our instructional assistants. Mrs. Martinez at the high school speaks Spanish, um, so we do have we're very fortunate to have those those folks on site to to support. I'm sorry, what I miss? <laughs> I think a lot of times some of the children translate for their own parents. Yeah, I've seen that happen too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, as our student representative shared, we hosted a Leader in Me parent workshop where our families learned about uh, the first four of the seven habits, and that was then followed by a family game night. If you were fortunate enough to attend, you would have heard me calling bingo. Uh, we handed out seven games during that game, and then we also had a follow-up raffle. We, uh, we had pizza from Big Woody's and then hot dogs from Yakko's. Um, that we um, handed out to families that were in attendance and then also had a basket raffle afterwards. It was fun and it was great to see the families engaged and um, the kids were really excited. I don't know, it was a really nice, for me, it was a really nice night. I didn't get to play any games, but <laughs> it was otherwise a great night. <laughs> and thank you also to the PTO for supporting the event. Absolutely. Yeah, the PTO donated um, 
They donated snacks and drinks for the families who attended both the Leader and Me night and then stayed for uh, the, the game night afterwards. So uh, kind of a pick-me-up after the Leader and Me training, um, waiting for the pizza and hot dogs to, to be handed out. Yeah. And our teachers taught the, the teachers have gone to specialized training to learn how to translate these practices for parents. So I don't know if you want to acknowledge the teachers, Zach, that, that led it. I think it was Kristen Zellner. Yeah, it was, it's our start with adults learning and modeling action team. So that would be Lori Fortunato, Kristen Zellner, Eric Malatoris, uh, Wendy Hauser, and Christina Attar. Um, so they were the, the group behind the planning and preparation for, for that event. And I can tell you that Mr. Muschlitz and Mr. Brem get their steps in and their bingo calling <laughs> out on a night like that, uh, you know, as they go around and make sure everything's in order and, you know, including carrying pizzas and everything else under the sun. So very grateful to them. And we had additional teachers come in and um, lead games and support games uh, uh, for the, for the follow-up session. So we're very grateful to our staff for their, their support. Uh, we just launched an intervention parent night. So uh, this was sent out to families who have children who received tier two or tier three interventions through our uh, multi-tiered system of support. And uh, we're going to be hosting a pizza party with root beer floats. And I'm going to be calling bingo again. Uh, got some feedback that parents enjoyed that. Uh, so we're going to offer some more bingo uh, and have some giveaways during that night. And again, this is kind of to um, boost interest in our Title I summer program that we're going to be offering this summer to families uh, to let them know about that um, and to get a better idea of who may be part participating in our, in our summer program. And our thanks go out to Mrs. Camello, who's our reading specialist, and Diane Kasachin, who's our comprehensive support teacher. Of course, our building administrators, and Jill Williams is also our school social worker. She's also helping to support us and thinking about different ways to engage families and different, different ways of communicating to help bridge that gap that sometimes may exist. So we're very, uh, we're very excited. We have not done an event like this before. This is sort of a new way we're trying to... Um, boost. It, it, usually intervention information doesn't go out until about April. And so we're, we're actually starting, you know, quite a bit earlier than we usually do to try to help families get the dates on the calendar and be aware of it. Um, and um, hopefully we will, we will see more participation in the future. Hello, everybody. Uh, so it's that time of year for our eighth graders to start thinking about course selections for next year. So you can see on this slide a little bit of a timeline that we have. Uh, Mr. Dord, our guidance counselor, is working closely with the high school counselors to arrange times and to arrange uh, students to, to meet the counselors and understand how the course process works, course selection process works, uh, but at the same time, given the information that they need to understand what goes into this process, uh, not necessarily by the students, but also at home as well, the conversations that parents should be having about what, what should be happening over the next several months. Uh, we do have uh, our the high school counselors, we're in on the 23rd. Uh, there is a parent information session that is on Tuesday, February 7th. It was yesterday. Oh, yesterday, I'm sorry. <laughs> Went well great. Attended. There we go. Well attended. Um, and then we also have uh, individual counseling sessions set um, where students will meet with counselors to talk about their course selections and to kind of see how this all fits into the, the uh, course selection process as they prepare themselves for the rest of the rest of this year and for next year as well. And um, I know Mr. Anderson also sent out for parents that weren't able to be there. That that was all. That presentation was all set, also sent out for families to uh, access remotely. And it's also linked on our guidance mm -hmm. page. There you go. Three Stud ways. <laughs> the students at the middle school have received emails from Mr. Dord as well. That kind of goes over that process. They have information that kind of shares with parents as well. Um, so he's done a really nice job of making sure that the message is, is out to the students as well as the families uh, so that the process can continue and, and move smoothly. Yeah, it's a really exciting time for students uh, and, you know, just trying to help them find their way. <laughs> Um, at the middle school as well, we look at PSSA released item review. Uh, so we had our first round on January 20th for math and then January 27th in ELA. Uh, so all teachers in the building were working with students, uh, trying to provide them strategies and the skills to kind of fill their toolbox so that when they see these, see these types of questions on the PSSA, uh, they, have, they work through that productive struggle. 
uh, and to look at the things that they've done in the classroom with the help of the teachers to kind of look at that question holistically and be able to identify what are the steps, what can I do, and how can I improve uh, you know, doing the problem the way it should be. Um, one of the things as you see in the takeaways, uh, you know, and, and is that it's a better understanding for scoring. So our teachers had a chance to kind of look at, as well as students, uh, you know, how, how are these questions being scored? What, what is it that needs to be done for our students to understand, our staff to understand as well, you know, what is it that we're looking for and how is it, how is it being graded and scored so the students get the most points possible for that, for that question. Um, we look at filling the toolbox, uh, you know, developing the strategies for success, um, looking at what what kind of strategies, what kind of you know, per, uh, you know, we talk about perseverance. What what can be done to help students understand better the understand the question, breaking down and looking at the strategies that were taught. Um, also looking at time management. When we when we look at long prompts, t the students are taking the the appropriate time to break down the long prompts and look at, you know, ways to break it down. Ways to kind of look at what, how can they attack the question, how can they uh, answer the question to the best of their ability and score the most points possible. And as always, we look at you know it, it, perseverance. You know, looking it's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult, but at the same time, you know, we're trying to fill the toolbox of our students so they work through the, that, that struggle. Um, so that they're able to work through the problem and get the correct answer and, and get the most points possible. I think what really stands out about this work the middle school is doing is it's a whole building, kind of everybody's all hands on deck and they're all working together toward and, and supporting each other through this process. And they did this after really looking at some of our PSSA data and where the areas of struggle were uh, and helping to expose kids to the, not, not just the expectations or the content, but the language of the test. The test is written in a certain way and you have to respond in a certain way in order to get the, the maximum points or or the points. So sometimes it's it's the language of the test, especially in the math area, that can be a, a hurdle for certain students. So I just want to thank Mr. Swicky and Mr. Parliament for their leadership in kind of <coughs> building that culture at the high or the middle school for um, you know this work. So just to give an example of that, to put it in context, um, and this is from a couple of years ago, we were at a training and they told us. Um, if the prompt says something to the effect of what strategies might work to solve this, you had to show that you tried more than one strategy. So if you tried the first strategy and you got the answer correct, you did not necessarily score all of the points because you didn't meet the prompt, which was um, to the effect of what, what strategies might work. So that's really important for kids to understand the genre and language of the test. Back to Ms. Morning, sir. <laughs> scheduling night, night was last night. <laughs> uh, parent information evening. It was really well attended, uh, between 60 and 65 parents in person, and then uh, numerous views already of what the um, school counselors have posted. We also had re a representative of LCTI um, on hand to talk about their programming, and that was <coughs> as well. Uh, Skills USA was originally scheduled for the most recent snow day. <laughs> Trying to remember the date, but we had a snow day, so it was rescheduled. Uh, and I did include, because it was rescheduled, they were unable to host <coughs> a person award ceremony because of a concert conflict the next night, I believe. So they did a virtual award ceremony, and I did uh, attach the video there if you wish to look at that. Um, we only had one participant this year. It varies tremendously from year to year. Uh, dependent upon the opportunities presented, the labs our students are in, and the interest of students. Um, Riley Connect participated in the Health Occupations Quiz Bowl, which actually wasn't held over at Ag Hall with the rest of the participants. It was held at um, the, uh, the one at 512 and 22. Um, so it was the best Western, yeah. So she wasn't um, at the site where most of the competitions were being held. So unfortunately, we weren't able to see her at um, Ag Hall with everyone else. And um, I'd just like to take a moment to thank uh, oh, sorry. Mr. Barna and the debate club. While I didn't include anything here because this was done before debate, what, um, what an amazing opportunity for not just the participants in the school, but for the other students to be able to see and to engage in um, disagreement that's not disagreeable. Um, so I think it's a great model for kids to be able to see that you can argue without being nasty. And you need to substantiate your points with evidence. 
And it's also okay when you're presented with evidence to change your opinion about something. So there, the resolution that they argued this year was that the United States should transition to all nuclear power. Um, and then you have one team arguing for and the other team arguing against that proposition. And just to see them pull historical data and fact and reference things like Three Mile Island in great detail um, is really impressive. And finally, uh, I attached the World Languages presentation. I think Kelly actually attached the World Languages presentation for me. Um, regarding the language options that are presented um, at the high school for students, this went out to all of the current eighth grade parents um, and is also posted on our website. And I think in... I didn't quite get to posting okay. it yet, but I will. <laughs> it will be posted. Um, but both both the German teacher and both Spanish teachers put a great deal of effort into this, along with their students who gave, which I thought was a really neat addition to this, they gave feedback about the programs and why they chose the language that they chose as well. It's interactive, so there's little yellow stars embedded throughout the presentation, and if you click on them, it's either a, the, one of the teachers or a student. If you go to the end, um, it, it, the, there's students talking about why did they choose the language and what, what have they enjoyed about it, what have, you know, it's different, different prompts that they're sharing, but it really is interesting to hear their perspective on on the languages. Yeah, I watched, I loved it. I, watched, I looked at a bunch of them and the, yeah, the kids, it was really fun. Yeah, really well done. So if you remember, the kids used to have a language exposure in eighth grade, so we put this together because our teachers, our world language teachers are actually at the high school. Getting them to the middle school to have any kind of exposure was difficult when they've got classes all day, so this was sort of an interim sort of step for the parents and the students to get that exposure. Um, I, don't, I guess I don't get the fun slides. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, this is a downer after all of that. Um, so I, these are just a couple of updates. And actually, homeschool is, is uh, Act 55, I believe, um, not Chapter 49. But it doesn't matter. It's, the, <laughs> it's, all, it's all things we must do. It's mandates that uh, have come through um, oh, in, in the last few months, you know. Um, so for homeschool, with Act 55, it, they... They have, are requiring schools to um, uh, ha allow homeschool students to come for up to 25% of their day, as well as extracurriculars and or things that are extracurricular in nature um, at the at the school. Um, so we have been working to you know, figure out how will we accommodate, <laughs> not how will we accommodate them because we have the classes and, you know, scheduling a student for 25% of their day isn't the hard part, but figuring out the operational piece of it. But so we did reach out to our homeschool families. We invited them to um, course the course selection information night um, to give them some information. We have about 20 students that are being homeschooled right now, and four about we have about four at the high school. Um, we've gotten some in, in, um, feedback that families might be interested in um, things like specials at the elementary. Um, so we don't know how how much this will be of interest to families, but we did reach out and share. I don't know, were you going to say something? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Just on that, do we do we anticipate? We'll have some some new policies that we'll have to work through, like when, by when? Like what, what can we anticipate as a board? By August. By August, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Yes, we'll have to update the homeschool policy. Um, some additional updates. Uh, chapter 49 was passed, um, I think, in July or about thereabouts in last July. And it had, it was very, it's very lengthy and it has like everything but the kitchen sink in it. There's something for everyone. <laughs> and literally, that's the way it feels. But a couple that are more pertinent to like more immediacy are um, we're starting, I believe it's next school year, uh, required to have a two year induction. Induction program. So induction is for new teachers, teachers who have don't don't have um, significant experience, don't have their level two certification. Uh, teachers are required for an induction program. Um, we're now required to do a two year program. So when we submitted our comprehensive plan, it was a one year program. Now we'll have to we have to rewrite it. <laughs> Have a two-year program. Um, there's some things that are required in addition to just having induction. It's um, 
is we have to also provide culturally responsive and sustaining education, professional development, and professional ethics and competencies, professional development. We have to provide that for induction, but also then for all staff. And I even think higher ed has to do um, some of these some of these pieces, if not all. And then the final thing that's required is we have to provide structured literacy training. So if you recall, we have had teachers going to letters training with the IU. That is structured literacy. So on this one, we're kind of ahead of the game. But one of the things the law specifically says is teacher certified in elementary, uh, English language arts, uh, special education, ESL, um, and it's certification, not your position. So if we have a teacher that is, let's say, a sixth grade science teacher, but they're a certified um, yeah. elementary teacher or ESL teacher, if they're certified as an ESL teacher, even if they're not currently an ESL teacher, they will have to attend this professional development. So fortunately, there's some other ways we can get structured literacy, so we're gonna tier it. Our, our folks that really, really do need this will we'll do a more comprehensive approach to PD, and for the folks that it's nice to know, but maybe they won't need as much professional development, we'll find some alternative ways to meet the requirement. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just there are limited professional development days and contractually teachers have the number of days they need to attend and you have a slew of items you need to cover, um, including some additional safety trainings that are now required. So it's not that it's a bad thing, it's just that it's another item that you have to find the capacity to support. Just to give you an idea, letters training is a minimum of like 18, 18 hours. So it's three, just modules one, two, and three are three days of professional development. So if you're a social studies teacher, but you have an ESL certification, you don't necessarily, you know, if you're, if you're in the middle school or high school, you don't necessarily need three days of professional development on phonics or phonemic awareness, for example. Well, to, that, to that point, remind me when, when you start to evaluate like any teachers that might transition, like from one, you know, classroom to another, because if, you, if you've got an 18 hour class that you've got to do by the, the start of next school year, when do you have to kind of make, do, do you have to expedite that, that decision process a little bit because of this? Like if you've got to move, like I think last year we tried to move somebody from the middle school down to, I say, I think kindergarten and then they mm -hmm. moved again, but mm -hmm. would that prevent you from being able to do that next year? No, because if they have the certification, they have to receive the training, whether they're teaching it currently or not. That's my point. So are you going to be forced to, like, ex like to prioritize them having that? so that they can move, is my, I guess is my question, yeah. I think that's what the state's requiring you to, to do. Sure. Um, in terms of timing, we typically have to make those decisions by May 31st, unless something of an emergency nature like the kindergarten um, situation that we had this year came up, but usually by May 31st. We, we prioritize primary for the, the structured literacy, particularly we would, we would we would, and we have this year, we prioritized our new teachers that joined us um, from primary. Um, then we prioritized special education. Um, we can't send everybody out at once. We just don't have enough subs. And our PD days, having the entire day full to do this is, you know, is, is difficult. Um, so the law doesn't require us to have everybody trained. It requires us to offer the professional development and so, I think there's some wiggle room in there, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. And it doesn't require a, a certain hour, like, you know what I mean? Like, so the letter of the law, we could provide an hour, you know what I mean? And we say it's in our continuing ed plan. But do we think that that's the best, you, you know what I mean? We don't think that that is the best or people will benefit from that. So I just, until we can, until we can provide what everybody needs in the way in which they need it, um, I think that there's some wiggle room for us while we do it, but it is nice to know at least one of the things on the list we already have. <laughs> um, in you know parent engagement, uh, the principals uh, worked very hard to put together a list of um, items that we had coming up this spring, and we were able to share them out with our homeschool and charter school families, inviting them to different events, um, you know, helping to get them into the building. Uh, you know, it's been a learning process for us. We hope to do this again, but it has been a learning process for us uh, how we can make it a better um, 
a better process moving forward. Uh, but I thank the principals for getting the information together and offering so many opportunities for our families to engage with us. Um, science standards, uh, you know, those are on the horizon. Um, we had, there was a two-day workshop that was offered by uh, Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Unit, um, and we had, uh, Mr. Brem took a team of teachers, Mrs. Kolsensky and Mrs. Weed, uh, as well as uh, Mrs. Robison from the middle school attended. Um, We've learned to, the new assessment's gonna be anticipated by 2026, um, and we know that the fourth grade as, as science assessment is moving to fifth grade. Um, and we know that one of the, uh, we think we know, it's unconfirmed, <laughs> but um, the word on the street is that one of the reporting categories for the fifth and eighth grade PSSA science test will be in the area of technology and engineering. So just a reminder to the board that we did add that STEM special to the middle, or, sorry, excuse me, to the elementary curriculum in an effort to get ahead of these, that component of the science standards and we're glad to, um, we're glad that that's in place and, and working out. Um, <laughs> we had to put together a plan for the state participation rate. One of the things uh, that Pennsylvania historically has not had a problem with meeting the 95% participation rate. Um, we historically have been very strong in that area and Salisbury has been very strong in that area. This year, um, Salisbury, in addition to many other schools and the state, fell below that 95% threshold. As you've heard from us, I think several times, we've had some opt-outs, um, refusals um, from our families, and, and it resulted in us being below 95% for all or some subgroups. Um, so we had to, the state required a plan. This, this is not new. It's new to Pennsylvania, but not new. The feds have required other states to do this. It's just new to us. Um, our IU provided some guidance in this respect, which we're, we're happy about, and we did submit a plan, which is Primarily communication, um, letting folks know that these are the con like there are legitimate consequences, and that students not being exposed to that type of test when they come to the Keystone, where it's a graduation requirement, are disadvantaged. And so it's better to get the experience now. Um, as Mr. Cuzo mentioned uh, about. Uh, data and how we look at the data and do teachers have access to the data. It is true for our reading math and some of our behavior data for the elementary level they have access, but things like attendance or discipline data is somewhere else and in other systems. We don't really have all of it together that's easy to crunch and look at in one place. Um, so there would be some advantages to having all of that. We're looking at Linkit and Sapphire, which is our current management system, also has a solution and both would provide Act 158 reporting assistance as well. Um, Linkit certainly offers quite a bit more. Um, they've provided us with a list of references for us to talk to other schools. They're also more expensive, so you know how it is. You get, you get more, <laughs> you're going to pay more. Um, and so we're looking at those two options and just want to remind the board why, the, you know, how this connects to the other things you've heard this evening. Um, we've had some intermittent internet issues at SMS. Um, we the the building technician, Mr. Landis and Mr. Smith, have done multiple, you know, switching out equipment, and uh, you know, it continued to um, continue to happen. So, you, those of you with middle school parents may have, our students may have heard that. Um, we actually had Service Electric, who's our provider, do a fiber test. They found one card that was bad, but it wasn't bad when they started, but it was bad by the end. So we don't, is that the, it, was it intermittent going in and out? So I don't know if they actually fixed it and believe, and, and by the way, I am, I am translating what I heard Mr. Smith say, so I'd appreciate no questions at this time. <laughs> so they found something bad, they fixed it, but they're not sure that's the cause, so they're monitoring it. That's the big picture, so um, we're continuing to watch it. So that was a lot of updates from um, the teaching and learning uh, angle. We hadn't done an update for January, so I just think that shows how much we've done since December, and um, thanks for your Thanks for your time and thanks to our principals for putting all that information together. Anyone have any questions? It's a lot of information and I wanna thank the staff and the administration. Um, all they're doing 
Uh, it's the beauty of a smaller school district. All they're doing here is trying to make our students successful. They're trying to keep the parents as informed and knowledgeable about everything that's going on in school and what their kids are doing in school. And I appreciate all your efforts. I mean, just to listen to this, it's like overwhelming. It's like, how do you do all this? So thank you very much. Okay. We will move on to, is there any old business? New business? I, I just want to bring one, and we don't need to discuss it, but uh, all this information is very important. However, a committee for a school board is to bring up topics that are going to further be brought to the board for board action. I don't see in our committee meetings that there's anything taken to the board for action. They're great presentations, but I don't believe they fit the definition of a board committee. Uh, they're supposed to be actionable items. And, I mean, good information, but it's a lot of time. So just throwing that out there for future meetings and what committees are actually purposely designed for. Uh, I mean, I think I think we can we'll take that feedback and continue to, to talk through that. I mean, I, I do think a lot of the, the content ultimately becomes, you know, actionable items. I think there's discussion points here, but I also think that, you know, a lot what's discussed you know what comes up here will will ultimately be become action i think it's a it's a forum for both for both uh, avenues so but i i understand that we we may not do things exactly how every other uh, board does does things so we can we can talk about it a little bit more I'm, I'm thinking about it i'm thinking about it a bit more for sure and and really it's up to the board to decide what information it it wants and this has been previously the board has wanted this information yeah if there's you know, we can. I mean, the reason I'm referring, like something like Link It, right? That's a great topic for the Ed Committee, for the administration to work with the board. The Ed Committee says, hey, we want to recommend this for approval, right? Like that discussion would be great. So. And well, we, we hope to eventually get there once we, we finish that. I just wanted to keep it on the radar. Sure. Because we do have some lulls when we're juggling so many different plates at a small district. There are some lulls in between and just trying to keep you informed. Many of the items on tonight's list, like the structured literacy, science standards, the data warehousing, our, our PSSA data and Keystone data, are all items that are embedded in our comprehensive plan. So many of these items, um, from my, my point of view, were updates on our progress on our comprehensive plan and those goals that we have. So from that, again, you know, we're happy to do whatever you need. <laughs> Just putting it on the table that that was the perspective. Yeah, my, one, my one suggestion would be if there's anything that was presented tonight that you, we'd like to elaborate on, I, let's let's raise that up and we can talk about it and see if we can have more con conversation on it for sure. And your your point is too much presentation. And, and I'm not saying it's bad. I don't think it belongs in a committee though. I think that's for like a superintendent report, right? Because it's not committee based work. It's great information for the board to know, but I don't believe it's committee work because there's no committee work being done. It's a presentation. I understand. Sure. Okay. Uh, do we have any citizens' comments? No. And with that, we our next meeting will be March 22nd here in the administration building at 7 o'clock, and we will adjourn the meeting. Do I take a vote on that? <laughs> okay. Or, Thank you. Eight, we'll reconvene at 820.
That's right. It is the February 8th regular board meeting. Uh, first, pursuant to board policy 1B.5, all meetings of the Salisbury Township School District are audio and video recorded. And I also want to note that an executive session was held uh, prior to tonight's meetings uh, to discuss the following matters, a uh, personnel matter, a confidential student matter, and a pending litigation matter, uh, Salisbury Township School District versus Lehigh Valley Health Network, having docket number 2018-C-3145 in the Lehigh County Court of Common Pleas. And Ms. Dickisher, may I have a roll call, please? Yes. Mr. DeFrank? Mr. Fries? Here. Mrs. Glenister? Present. Mr. Ganahl? Here. <laughs> Mrs. Klinger? Here. Mr. Cuzo? Here. Mrs. McKelvey? Here. Mrs. Nemitz? Here. Mr. Spinner? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. All right, thank you. Um, next item is 1.3, uh, noting any changes to the agenda. Um, first of all, does anyone have any changes that they would like to call out? Shaking heads. I actually do have an item that I would like to add to the agenda. Um, so the item is a motion. I would going to make a, an addition to the new business section. Um, that is section 9. And the, the addition is going to be... Um, to nominate for a new term starting um, July 1, 2023 through um, June 30th, 2026 for the representative for the uh, Carbon Lehigh IU uh, representative. So with that, I'd like to make a motion to uh, update the agenda to add a new item to new business. Can I get a second, please? Second. Uh, any questions or comments? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So when we get to new business, we'll uh, we'll go through that nomination process. All right. Next, um, can I have a motion? Or I will make a motion to approve the agenda as amended with the addition uh, to new business. Can I get a second, please? Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, now we will get to 1.5 citizens' comments. Uh, do we have any citizens? Nope. Shaking head very quickly. Thank you, Ms. Kirk. And we will move on to a motion to approve a number of minutes. We have uh, the curriculum technology meeting on January 18th, 2023, uh, regular board meeting January 18th, 2023, uh, the operations committee and the Finance Committee meetings that happened on February 1st, 2023. Uh, can I have a motion to approve those? Move. To move. Can I have a second, please? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. I Any a, opposed? I had a point of. Oh, I'm sorry. But, but you're right. I, I actually, there is a comment. You, Mr. Cuzo, you have a question. I just wanted to make sure I didn't go back, but I noticed the minutes changed since the last time I looked at them regarding um, the increases in budget earlier today, they were both at 627,000. I just want to make sure, we, without going back to the meeting, that these were actual the numbers that were spoken about. Can you clarify which minutes you're, you're referring to? Uh, last last meeting, finance minutes. Okay, and you're... Earlier today, the minutes were different. So I'm yeah. just, I just want to make sure that the 627 and the 946 were the numbers discussed during the meeting. Yes, that's correct, and thank you for pointing that out. That was a typo when the minutes were typed up. Um, the regular education number was transposed again for the special education number, so the correction was made. So what's posted is the correct. Okay, any further questions? I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the vote again, just in case. Uh, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm also an aye, by the way. All right, thank you. <laughs> Okay, and we're moving on to item 1.7, the treasurer's report. Um, can I have a motion to approve the treasurer's report? I actually have a question on it. All right, well, I'll, make, first. I'll make a motion um, and a second, and then we'll have questions. Uh, all right, do I have a second? Second. All right, are there questions on the treasurer's report, Mr. Spinner? 
Yeah, I, I have a couple of small questions here. Um, in regards to the expenditures in the facilities and maintenance uh, count 2600, we're currently showing 101% spent of our budget. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, back when the discussion was made and the motion was approved to pay the first payment to McClure for the GISA project and the resolution was passed, that $1.4 million was paid out of facilities. Uh, tomorrow is the closing on the bond. The money will be wired then to Pliggett into the account that was set up. As soon as we receive the checks for that, a check will be written. Uh, so this will be reflected in a future, you'll see that percentage drastically drop when the deposit is made against that expenditure. Okay, so there's no exposure then. This is just purely for the reimbursement purposes for the bond? Correct. Okay. Um, also, in account 1500, we're showing almost 200% of what our current budget was. Can you just comment on that? Uh, yes, sometimes um, between the budget and where items are coded, we will do some budgetary transfers and allocations based on the expenditures of the students. So we have not yet started to look through for budget transfers that need to be done. Uh, I believe the 1500s are non-pub too, so there'll be federal funds for those that can be allocated against those expenses too. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Can I just remind us when we're talking about budgets and numbers that the budgets, we just say 1500, let's follow up with what it actually is, which sure. I appreciate. 1500 is the non-public education. So there's uh, various accounts that go in there, various programs. And sometimes when you're doing the budget, you may budget in regular education and the expenditure may end up being from there. And that's why we do the budget transfers to better allocate the budget based with the funds, so I will be taking a look at all of that and bringing that to the board too. I believe our one non-public school also had some unspent funds, which right. they have from last year, which they did recently spend, and that I'm not sure if that's the yep. expense, but that could very much be the um, why it's over what's expected. Yeah, I appreciate that, that clarification. And I'm sorry, on the 2600, that is operations and facilities. <laughs> Got to stop talking in numbers. <laughs> oh, you're looking at them all day. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Any more questions for Mr. Nickasher? Sure. All right. Uh, all in favor to approve the uh, the t January 2023 23 treasurer's report? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> all right. Thank you. And we will move on now to uh, payment of bills. Um, I'd like to make a motion to pay the bills. Uh, one note here, we've got 1.3 uh, million of general fund expenditures and uh, 144,000 payroll <coughs> expenditures. Do I have a second? I'm making a motion to pay the bills. Second. Second. Uh, any questions on paying the bills? Tom. Yeah, I, I do have one question. Uh, in regards to the high mark, uh, it's roughly 315,000. Is this for our, our monthly premiums or is there any other that that's for? No, that is the monthly okay. premium. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All in favor of paying the bills? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right. I, bills I, are paid. I missed my discussion point, but it's really just a point of clarification. Is there a reason these are not publicly available? They're all in administrative content. And the bills. They should be. Yeah. I think we just put them all off slack. We can we can adjust and that. They right? might get moved after. Moved after we approve. But these should. After you them? I don't believe in this case. I think the public should see these at this point, right, Christine? The minutes I know are different. We have to approve those because yeah. before they're. But I don't believe bills. Can we follow up with you? Would that be okay? Okay. Yeah, well, we've approved them now, so I think yeah. we we can move them. But yeah, we can we'll, we can we'll we'll get clarity on that for sure. Okay. Um, all right. Item one point nine. Uh, report for the sec by the secretary. Ms. Nickasher, do you have a report this month? Sure. Just um, 
little bit of information. I'm sure you've all heard or read articles surrounding the court ruling on the state funding formula. Uh, after more than a three-month trial on Tuesday, the uh, Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court ruled that the state's school funding system was unconstitutional and it vi violated the education clause of the Pennsylvania Constitution for failing to provide all students with access to comprehensive, effective, and complementary system of public education that will give them a meaningful opportunity to succeed academically, socially, and civically. This lawsuit originally started back in 2014, and then Act 35 was introduced. That was the fair funding formula that was passed in 2026. However, there was many challenges uh, with that as far as the system not working for funding. Uh, during this trial, there was 41 witnesses that spoke and over 14,000 pages of testimony provided. Um, several state entities, including the Pennsylvania Board of Education, were being sued as part of this lawsuit. At this point in time, it's unclear what the next step is going to be. Uh, most likely, there is going to be appeals filed against that. So this could possibly drag out for another five to 10 years before we see any kind of changes that could take place in the funding. So, Yeah, and I did want to note, because I was reading up on this too, the judges decision did not actually state that funding needed to be increased, right? It was, I think it was more that it was... The way yeah. um, wealthier and uh, yeah. poor districts are funded is the big yeah. issue at yeah. hand, but then we don't know how that affects everyone as a whole yeah. if something would be changed in that aspect. So there could be back drastic changes down the road, but again, there's most likely going to be appeals filed, which will drag it out further, so we may be stuck where we're at for a while to come. Yeah, and I think the judge also said that there was uh, no deadline for making this happen, even in her decision, right? Correct. Yeah, so. Right. And that's it. Thank you. Well, more, more to come, I'm sure, on that one. Uh, um, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we'll move on to the uh, Curriculum and Technology Committee uh, items for uh, action this evening. Uh, Mrs. Klinger. Okay, I'd like to move items 2.1 through 2.3. 2.1 is a special education settlement agreement and release. 2.2 is an overnight trip for Model UN to Ithaca, New York for April 20th through the 23rd. And 2.3 is the approval of a special education student teacher with Tracy Merrill. At, I think she's at the high school? Elementary, Elementary school, sorry. Second grade. <laughs> Okay. Um, may I have a second, please? Second. Any questions? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay. We'll move then to uh, Mr. Spinner and the Operations Committee tonight. Uh, yeah, during our last meeting, we uh, continued our discussion around facilities and space planning, uh, where the administration went ahead and gave us an update on the modular option, as well as some other information in regards uh, of what we're hopefully going to look to move forward with on what to do with Western as well. Um, in regards to items tonight, uh, we have item 3.1, which is the interim business office service agreement uh, for the extension for... Uh, business office services for uh, Christine. Um, so I'd like to move item 3.1 at this time. Second. Any questions or discussion? Uh, yeah, I have some questions about this. So um, the way that the contract is worded, it looks like it becomes effective uh, when it's signed and um, then is valid for 180 days. So that would indicate that we can keep Christine into the summer and that I don't think that, I, I personally don't feel comfortable with that. Um, I'd like to see some more parameters placed around how we're gonna be using her in terms of both when her end date is and how many hours we're gonna be allotting her from now until the end of the school year because it, you know, it looks like we can use her up to 20 hours per week, and I know a lot of the time we used before was things like um, 
changing over the data system and audit stuff, but those things are finished. So how many hours are we intending on using her moving forward? And when is that end date going to be? I would, I, I honestly didn't look close enough, but I would, I would back that same statement. I would like more clarification on uh, 20 hours a, a, a week is a part-time employee. Um, and just the scope of an end date. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, I can speak to that now. Um, we are we are still using Christine for the conversion for CSIU. Uh, while we would think it would be done, it is not done. Some of the data did not convert accurately, and there's still quite a few pieces that we are working on until we go live. So the payroll piece has been converted, and um, the employee portal has been converted, but there are quite a few other pieces that we're still working on. Um, in terms of other services, we're looking for Christine to mentor Dawn in a variety of capacities, including um, working through the budgeting process, as this will be the first year that, that Dawn is working through the budgeting process, um, as well as some one time a year business um, office functions. Um, we're also working through negotiations with our professional staff um, that we're looking that will be looking to Christine to provide some mentorship in costing out proposals and some of those activities. Um, in terms of an end date, uh, we can set this wherever the board would like to set it. Uh, we recommended that we have it um, through the development and passing of the final budget. So June thirtieth. June thirtieth. I mean, I'm comfortable with that. It's just the way the contract is written. Um, it's 180 days from January 1st. That's not how it's written. It says it's a, it, the assignment will start on, on or after January 1st, 2023, if all requirement documents have been signed. So if the, unless this was signed prior to the board approving it, then it would be signed tonight or tomorrow or whatever. And that's when the 180 days. June 30th is actually when the final budget is passed is my, was my intention. Okay. But we, we're not gonna put a cap other than this 20 hours on her. Did you stay within 20 hours in the first contract with Christine? Over the length of the contract, not every week. Some weeks were higher, some weeks were lower. Okay, because it Things says like, that for this example, position when, is limited to 15 to 20 hours per week unless agreed to in advance by the LEA and PASBO. Did you have that agreement with them? Yes. Okay. So, for example, um, when the AFR was due and they were working on it the week of Christmas, that was significantly over. Okay, so how many hours has Christine worked since the um, first contract was approved? I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. I can get that for you. When does the board want to put a cap on a certain number of hours? I would feel more comfortable if we did that. And what is the number? It, well, is the question, is the cap on the week or is it the, the overall six month period? Is that I would say a, a cap for now until June 30th is fine. And that, a number of hours between yes. now and June yes. 30th. So, so essentially what you're looking for is how many hours of it, right now you're saying it's 20 per week for how many weeks is until June 30th and that would be the total cap of hours regardless of how you use it. If you're high in one week, low in another week, as long as you don't exceed that total amount by June 30th, that's where it is. And I'm still questioning if we really need 20 hours a week on average because it is a part-time position. So uh, I, I would challenge the admin to, to come under that since it's almost like a time material not to exceed type contract. Um, I would think uh, they're going to do their best to be efficient. Uh, yeah. And we I, have I, been. We I, have I, been under this. Um, her largest amount of time actually was data scrubbing out of Skyward information, trying to get it in a format to convert. And that was all done outside of here. The resources with helping me were phone calls, um, maybe coming in once a week, and I would compile everything that I had questions on or we needed to work through. We did work um, tandem the week of Christmas on the AFR um, to get through that and get that posted. So that was a joint effort, but a majority of the time is spent with CSIU conversion, and unfortunately we don't have a lot of leeway around that. We have to get that information in a format that they can upload so we can start using this software. Uh, I'm indifferent personally, whether it's total per week or I think it's how do you get the job done? How do you get the job done most efficiently? And I, I, I trust the administration to do that. I mean, 
with the expectation that it's June 30th when the budget's closed, and within the idea of it's 20 hours, if it's this week, it's 18 or 22, just get the job done. This is what it comes down in my mind. <coughs> what, what, is, what, is your, what are you expecting in terms of, are you expecting there to be a heavy, heavy usage and then it's going to kind of ramp down as you get closer to the end of the year? Is that, is that what you're... Yeah, I mean, Christine working with me right now is on a very minimal, I mean, most of the emails that I see are tickets going to CSIU for information on how she needs to get that uploaded or what format they need it in. Sure. You know, I'm involved in all those correspondence, but that's, she's the main lead on that conversion. Yeah. And then it's also how we're going to roll that out and it's scheduling of the training of each departments and what their functions are. So she's been coordinating and handling that aspect. Yeah. So is the concern... Is the concern the language? Is it sounds like the concern is one the language, and then the, the other concern is just the, the 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 weekly hours. Is that what is that what I'm hearing? Um, all right, Sarah, sounds like you want to chime in here. Is the language in this um, agreement the same as the language in her first agreement? <laughs> yes. This is the mm -hmm. same, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So if we were approved it before, like. I think I, I think I think, the, I think that my, my question with the, the hours specifically, Sarah, is that some of the things that we have were hired her to do have, like like the audit, have been completed. Right. So so yeah. Well, and, and, right. and, and so I don't understand why us. we need the same amount of hours moving forward if some of the, the work has been done. And that that was my concern. It's it's just it's a range. Okay. Well, and, there, and just it uh, allows for flexibility. With the same contract, the same contract was for 180 days, and that's where it was going to end. And now we're adding another 180 days to the original contract. 20 hours a week for that scope seems excessive. And a migration should that's be done in-house. But we should be doing that in-house with employees who are staying here, because that's very important knowledge, going to a new system and being hands-on with that data and that process. We don't have the staff to be able to do that. I mean, this is the difficult part. Each individual has to go through training now, too. And several of those trainings are multiple days you know, of their of their week. I mean, we have a two and a half hour payroll person and she has spent significant time of her personal time too, you know, reading over. I, and I totally get it. I've been through many myself. Absolutely. I, I understand the process and I know the importance of being yep. the person in the district. I don't think we would have been able to do this on. conversion. I think it would have been difficult. Let's just make sure we each get a chance to finish what we're saying here. Um, but yeah, go ahead. I don't know who was... No, I just, I, I just being, being in technology and working in a school district and going through many of these processes, if I personally wasn't involved deep in it, I don't gain the knowledge when it comes to using it. Knowing where that data is coming from, how you're formatting and giving it to them is invaluable moving forward. To pay a third party, Christine, to do that, we lose that when she leaves, right? We don't have that... that if she's doing that, that's it's valuable to know that. That's all I'm saying. Are you, this is a moot point because the work's already done. We won't be doing any conversions of data. Well, there's still. We'll, this is let's done. Go, let's go one at a time here. So who 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 wants to speak at this point? Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah. I, I don't know. I ju I just feel like we're nitpicking this contract for no reason. Um, it it provides flexibility, limited to 15 or 20 hours per week or less. Mm -hmm. It's not saying she has to work 20 hours. It's not saying she's limited to only three. It just provides flexibility for the administration to use as they see fit. Yeah, and it seems to me it'd be more fiscally irresponsible to have a limit, an upper or a lower limit. It's sort of as needed. We're, we're trusting Christine <laughs> at a very bargain rate, we all agreed, you know, to get her expertise to be her, here and help us. I think the more restrictions that we put on it, the less useful it will be and less helpful it'll be in the long run for the district. And we are, again, this is our district, small district, few personnel, trying to kind of have many hats and do everything and there's only so many hours in the day. I mean, we're just back at the same situation we are in so many positions. Tom, 
were you trying to? Yeah, just, I mean, we're, we're essentially looking at 20 hours for 25 weeks, which is roughly 500 hours. And I mean, we're, we're going back and forth. I, I know every penny matters here uh, with our district. I mean, we're talking $28,000 over the entire, if we max out the contract. So, you know, I, I, I agree to Joe's point. You got, do have to get in, you gotta get dirty with data in order to really understand this way you can be better moving forward. But I think at the same time, since we're still finishing up the transition according to what I heard Dylan, I think it's still good to have someone there to support that effort as well as we run into some issues, especially given how light we are in the business office as well, to give them that flexibility to get that support done. Like, like I said, the goal is not to spend the full 500 hours. Right, so they, they're effectively putting a cap on top of that. And just like we do this in any type of like a construction contract, we would consider it's like a time material not to exceed. And the goal is to efficiently manage it to get the work done that we need to get done and try and go underneath. Okay, and I, and I think they're gonna do that. I, I do in this case. I guess one question I'd have is, have we exceeded the 20 hours since the start of this, this calendar year at, at any point? No. No, okay. Past several weeks, I've maybe communicated less than five hours with Christine on any given thing, and I'm not sure of the time that she spent on the pieces that she's working on. Right now, she's doing the HR module, so for all of the insurance and benefit pieces, bringing that over, I don't know the amount of time outside of her time with me, but clearly well under 20 hours. Well, and you've, you've signed timesheets, so mm -hmm. did you say since the beginning of the year or since the beginning of the calendar year? Beginning of this calendar year. Yeah, since we've okay. started. because we have, be, be, since the beginning of the school year, no, we I have. Under, I understand that. Okay, um, just to make sure we're then, not. And then we understand that the, the, the under, we expect this, this, this agreement to, to cease at the end of the, the budget year, basically once we've approved the budget, so we understand that. At the latest. At the latest, okay. Does anyone else have any more thoughts? Um, and just, just one follow-up here. I mean, do you see this trying to be extended again a third time? I do not. Okay. Because I, I, I would mean, think if, if that does become the case, you, there's going to be a lot of justification required for it. I think the full year gives Dawn the opportunity to, be, to have mentorship for the full year in scope of the business administration responsibilities. Anyone else? Okay. Um, then we'll vote. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. Seven two. Right. Then we'll move on to uh, the finance committee, which would be myself. Um, I have two items, I'm going to move them separately. Uh, first, we have item 4.1, which is an update to the uh, school per capita. Um, so with that, I would like to ask for a motion and a second to move the update to the f per capita. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right, any questions on the updated list? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right. Then we will move on to item 4.2, which is the preliminary budget. I will note that we reviewed that at the last finance uh, committee meeting. Um, the other note I want to make is that um, the minutes that we approved uh, earlier in the meeting have a good summary of some of the expenditure increases that were um, you know, added to this, this budget. Uh, so if there's any questions about that, please refer to that. Um, with that, um, I'm bringing forward item 4.2, which is the preliminary general fund balance. Um, so we're being asked to adopt that attached 2022-2023 preliminary general fund balance, reflecting total expenditures in the amount of $45,057,777 dollars. And that requires a real estate tax levy of 24.9622 mills. And that will also allow the administration to apply for all referendum exceptions. Um, with that, I'm asking for a second to move that forward. Second. All right, now questions. I have one question. I might have missed it last time. In the page 13 on the 2700 account, 
How is there a negative 4,000 in the budget? Yep. Um, what that has to do with is when we ran, when we pulled the salary module over into CSIU, if individuals have uh, salaries coded to different line items, it only pulled one. We did not know that, and it applied benefits. So this is Chris Smith, his health insurance. That should have netted down in the 200 in the 2800 section. So as we start going through, uh, that's the copay piece of it. That applied it against the piece that he's getting paid for being the transportation. Can you rephrase that? I'm sorry, I didn't follow that at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard. It's um, thanks for saying that because uh, I was like, uh. if an individual gets paid for more than one function, they have different account codes that their salaries are charged to. A piece of Chris's salary is charged for doing the transportation duties. When we rolled the salary module over, we didn't know that it picks the first account code. So if that's not their primary account code. It applied. We went through and we made the, we caught them and made adjustments. That was one that was missed. It actually is supposed to be netted down in the 2800. So that is on our radar. We have a few other little tweaks of things that we saw, you know, as we start going through and refining it. But that will be moved for the next pass. It it netted. It pulled the wrong account code basically when we rolled it. Other questions? All right. I I actually have one. We, so. At the, at the finance committee we, we meeting, we spent a lot of time sp speaking on the uh, why the expenditures had increased, but we really didn't talk a, a ton about the revenues. I know we talked about the uh, the state money, but I'm just curious if we had a little bit more insight in terms of why the, the revenues went down a little bit. Uh, if there's any additional insight that could be provided, I would like to hear that. Um, for one, I, I did reference that for federal, we have nothing in the budget right now other than salaries that are being coded for title. So that's a revenue neutral. So we put just revenue in to cover those expenditures. We won't have a better outlook until we start to see what we're going to get from federal. Same with state. We left that flat line to last year. Um, the only thing that we made adjustments on was the local and and those items, um, I believe I covered some of them in the discussion. Um, primarily, it's our yeah. only 1.185 increase is what you know our uh, 4.1 tax levy is. So there isn't a lot of growth right there. So everything else is flatline. That's why you're not seeing a big jump right now. As we start to see the governor's budget and more outlook of what we think we're going to get. We can start adjusting more of the state. We'll start building in some federal once we have a better outlook what we think we're going to get there. So right now there's nothing in for federal other than what needs to be covered for Title I salaries and benefits. Okay. Uh, anyone else? All right. Uh, we're going to uh, do a roll call for this vote. Uh, just making sure if you, if you could uh, sure. administer that, please. All right. Okay, Mr. DeFrank. Mr. Fries. Yes. Mrs. Glenister. Yes. Mr. Ganahl. Yes. Mrs. Klinger. Yes. Mr. Cuzo. No. Mrs. McKelvey. Yes. Mrs. Nemitz. Yes. Mr. Spinner. Yes. Okay. We have seven yeses, one no. All right, thank you. And we will move on to the Personnel Committee and Mrs. Klinger. Okay, tonight I'd like to move items 5.1 through 5.7. But items 5.1 through 5.4 are employments. We have employed a part-time IA. We have employed, employed a full-time special education teacher at SHS who will be serving until the uh, June 7th, uh, we hired an assistant middle school soccer coach, an assistant middle school swim advisor. Item 5.5 is an increase from a part-time to full-time nursing assistant at the high school. 5.6 is a general leave from February 1st through February 28th. And item 5.7 is the substitute deletion list. So may I have a second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you.
you. And we'll move on to um, Mrs. Gunnister, Policy Committee. Hi, so tonight we're just doing the first reading of the policy, um, Board Policy 6A.4, the Title I Parent and Family Engagement, which I believe we need to re review every year. So the only changes were a few edits that I made um, to commas and things like that. Uh, so Thank you. Uh, if anybody has any questions about that, and if not, I think we'll be voting on that in March, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Are you a fan of the Oxford comma or not? Uh, is that a serious question? <laughs> the answer to that is yes. I just want to make sure that we're on the okay. same we're all on the same page here. Yes, yes, yes. Ask my family. So, yes. Heather's dropping her things because of the question. You got so excited. <laughs> I took an entire, I was an edit, I'm, you know, I'm a professional editor, took a whole class on the Chicago Manual of Style, and that's like the cornerstone. So yes, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Canal, student activities. Yeah, so uh, I do have something to bring to the board tonight. Uh, uh, but we don't have anything to move on this, do we, tonight? This is just, okay. this is just a first reading. Right it's oh. a, yeah, next month. Oh, I appreciate you checking okay. me. Thanks. Thanks for keeping me in check. Mr. Goodall, student activities, I'm sorry. Sure, okay, just making sure. Okay, uh, I do have one thing to bring to the board tonight. Um, it's a new co 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 op cooperative. It's been a long day, okay? Uh, so bear with me. <laughs> um, to establish a, 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 with, with our baseball program in Lehigh Christian Academy, um, their, their high school program. So basically, in essence, um, we would allow students of the, uh, the, the, the Lehigh Christian Academy players to, or, or, or young men to play baseball at, um, at Salisbury. Uh, and it's just, it, it, in this ever-changing world, it, it, this is an opportunity for us to let kids have access to extracurricular events, and I, I just try to, as long as it makes sense, to do everything in our po possible to, to make that a, available to any kid. Um, it is a bonus that some of the kids, I, I believe at, at least one, is a Salisbury resident in this in this case too, um, and uh, um, so I will. That's pretty straightforward. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to shoot them out. Uh, Monica's with us here too because she has more of the detail than I do. Um, in case we need to go there. So I'm going to. Br I'll make a motion for 7.1 to authorize the administration to establish a PIAA cooperative sponsorship in high school baseball with Lehigh Christian Academy High School. Second. Any questions? Are we going to have a baseball field? <laughs> we have a baseball field. We do have a baseball field. Is it, is it going to be ready for? It's ready. It's it ready, ready right now. Okay. <laughs> um, they dug the opening bigger. Bill said it was roughly 15 deep, four feet wide, and six feet long. And they were not. They dug down 15 feet, and they were ab They were not able to find a cause. Um, they backfilled the hole with recycled concrete, tamped it down. Heavy. <laughs> um, did, I time, did I put a time capsule down there? I don't know. And uh, added the topsoil and finished it off. And I think there have been some kids running around out there. So if you live long enough in the Lehigh Valley, you're going to deal with a sinkhole at some point in time. It's just, it's just by nature the sure. place that we live in. All right. This wasn't a sinkhole. Oh yeah. So anybody have any questions? We are going to have a baseball field to answer Mr. Freeze's question. Yes. Um, any other questions? I just have a, a, a question. I just feel I don't understand it. <laughs> Lehigh Valley Christian Academy, right? I, and I have no problem with it. I'm just understanding it. How are they a private school, right? Yes. How, how does that, but like, how is like something like Central Catholic who's a private school? Are they, how are they different? They're just different. I mean, so it's like, it's like, uh, how do I? Question this. I'm just asking for my own understanding. No, I, I mean it, it, they're they're not they're just different schools. One is Catholic based. Alton Central Catholic is Catholic based, or Christian is. I guess it, what I'm saying is, are they so small they can't form their own team? Correct. Yes. That's where they're struggling. Yes. And then they play for Salisbury. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Just like we don't have the capacity for a lacrosse team, so we send our kids to Central. Uh, okay. And then the reverse for wrestling. We have Central come over to us and wrestle under Salisbury. Yeah. And but field I, hockey. I'll, I will say, if you if you get a chance, there was an article in the morning call where they interviewed Mitch Miller, a senior fr who was from Central mm -hmm. and wrestling for us, and his comments on the co-op were just it was spot on, mm -hmm. I, and, and I was it was well put, and 
didn't really talk about any of the wins and losses as much as the friendships and, and, and the relationships built in the room. So, But our wrestling team, did I see it's 5-5? Five, five? They actually won some meets this year? Won quite a few. Yeah. Which is wonderful. They never had that opportunity before until we did this cooperation with Central. So that's great. Junior high is 7-2, and two, if I recall correctly. Correct. Right. All right, Mr. Gnoll, you're in the middle of a vote, I believe. Yes, we are. Okay. So, Sorry. All right. <laughs> all, uh, so we, we did get a second, and then we have questions. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We move on to the uh, report section of the evening, and uh, we'll start with the, uh, the intermediate unit. Uh, Mrs. McKelvey. Uh, not much to report. Our last meeting was the day of the snow day. And so basically we just had a, an extremely brief virtual meeting just to approve the things that had to be done. So the only thing of note is that the report is that our search for a new director of our IU is going very well. There's been a lot of bites from what I understand. I don't know exactly what that means, but a lot of interest in, um, you know, they're moving forward with the process. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeFrank is not here, so we will not get a report on LTRIC, and we will move on to LCTI, Mrs. Nemitz. Okay, um, Senior Recognition Night for LCTI will be Wednesday, May 31st at 6.30 p.m. at the PPL Center. This is the night after our own Senior Recognition Night, so that's gonna be a very exciting week. Um, the, con the LCTI's comprehensive plan is open for public comment. Um, and they're holding a focus group about it in February, and then uh, the JOC will be asked to approve it at our next meeting. And uh, Mrs. Morningstar already spoke about this, but um, Skills USA District 11 competition was held January 26th. There were 400 students that participated in 56 competitions around the Lehigh Valley. It was mentioned that our student was at a hotel, but there were kids in a wide variety of locations. Um, for their competitions, and there were one, two, three, four, five um, CTEs that sent students to that competition. Um, there were only three of us there from the JOC, but you know we kind of walked around together. This is the first time I had ever been to Skills USA, and I was really impressed by the talent of these students. And um, one thing that we talked about a lot was their focus. They were able to just focus on their task while people were walking around looking at them, you know, just watching what they were doing. They were being judged as they were doing their work and it was really very impressive. And um, we loved that, you know, parents came and set up chairs just like they were at a baseball game, but they were sitting there watching their child plumb something. So it was really neat. And it's true. <laughs> um, I make a motion that we approve the 2023-2024 Lehigh Career and Technical Institute budget as recommended by the LCTI Joint Operation Committee on January 25th, 2023 in the amount of $30,704,013. Salisbury's portion of the budget is $1,206,822.39. Second. Any questions? Just a quick question, Sarah. So is our portion rely entirely on how many kids we send or do we have like a base amount and then, or is it more complicated? It's more, so there's um, several different portions that we give money to. So the, the general fund and the academic center fund are based on our share of the student population, but our contribution to the capital fund and I think the technology fund is based on our property market share. Okay, thank you. I love that presentation every year. I find it so fascinating. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Mrs. Glenister, uh, do you have a PSBA update tonight? I do. Um, the first thing is uh, you probably saw in the news that the state auditor general recently questioned the amount of money some school districts are holding in their savings accounts, not us, but other places. And they're talking about how some cyber charter schools are way in excess of what they should be holding. So that's another talking point against the charter schools. I guess a couple of them, three or four of them that they listed here have exceeded 50% of expenditures in their savings accounts. Yeah. 
We could name them. It's Aspera Bilingual Cyber, Esperanza Cyber, and Central Pennsylvania Digital Learning Foundation had savings that exceeded 50% of expenditures. So yet another reason why we try, we're we trying to you know, change that. Apparently last night, President Biden highlighted um, youth mental health in the State of the Union speech, and he's apparently the U.S. Department of Education will be investing $240 million in grants to help schools tackle that problem. So maybe we'll get lucky and get some of that. That would be awesome. Um, luckily, you helped explain the public school funding situation, the, that lawsuit that came out. Uh, and part of what I printed didn't come with me for some reason, because there was a printer issue. But one of the things, um, apparently Texas and Pennsylvania are the only two states that prohibit school board members from being paid, um, which is interesting. I didn't realize we're one of the only two. You're not required to, but we, you cannot do it in those two states. Um, Apparently, Colorado just passed it. They can be paid up to $150 a day. And in Florida, I believe some districts pay $47,000 a year. I'll, I'll yeah. make a motion. So, uh, yeah, just to remind everybody, we do this out of the goodness of our hearts. Um, however, uh, there is a bill that's been introduced. My husband would love that if that was my job. Um, the the uh, bill that's been introduced by somebody here uh, because I, I lost the other part of it, but they have introduced a bill which would not you know, apply to us, any current members, but they are looking at, at trying to get it to be able to be paid in, in Pennsylvania, which would mean, of course, the taxpayers would pay for it. So it's not a done deal, but it's just, I was surprised that we were the only, one of the only two states that don't allow what was it. was the other state you said? Uh, Texas. Texas. Mm -hmm. Texas and Pennsylvania, because Colorado just passed something recently. Um, and then that, I was going to follow that on with the data, which I don't have the exact dates here, but it is time for the election. And if anybody wants to run, now is the time. I believe the petitions are open now, and you have to have them signed by, was it March 7th? Is that the deadline? Yeah. yeah, they open the 14th. They have to be in by the 7th. And so if anybody else would like to do all this fun stuff for free in Pennsylvania, you know, that's how you do it. <laughs> Can I ask you a question, Becky? I don't know if you happen to know. I thought about it the other night. I mean, we're going back a few years. Has, have school districts at all seen one penny from casinos? Oh, I have no idea, yeah. They're online everywhere in PA. The revenue they're generating is way higher than the initial concept of when they landed in PA. Yeah. I'm just curious. I've never seen a dime come into schools from it. Yeah, do you know? I, yeah, interesting. Microphone. Yeah. <laughs> there was an opinion piece in the morning call about that last week. I'll find it and send it to you. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think Christine was grabbing her mic to say something. Was that wrong? I guess that was wrong. Never mind. <laughs> so that, that is all I have. But I just found that fascinating that Pennsylvania and Texas are in the same boat. So who knows? Maybe someday we'll get paid for all this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, there is the solicitor's report coming up. So maybe that's why she was prepping. Yeah. <laughs> Waiting with bated breath. <laughs> okay. Um, first, I just want to answer Mr. Cuso's question from earlier this evening. Yes, the bills are public even before they're voted on. So, okay. Um, and then um, the other piece of my report is there was a question um, from the board that if it would sell property via a private sale, whether or not the board would have to accept the highest offer um, for the property. And the answer to that is no. Um, in the past, historically, um, the court did not um, require uh, the, the highest offer to be um, accepted by the school board. Um, but in the past, they also would make a determination as to whether or not the proposed sale was in the public interest. So that is how the court would justify deviating um, from accepting the highest offer. Um, in 2018, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court issued a decision um, where they it indicated that it is inappropriate for courts to have to um, determine whether or not the proposed sale is in the public interest. They basically need to look at what the statute requires, which is um, whether the petition contains the required information under the statute, um, whether um, two disinterested individuals who are familiar with real estate in a geographical area have um, viewed the property for sale and concluded that the um, offer that the school board accepted um, is a better price than they would obtain at a public sale. Um, so if if you would want to choose um, a an offer that wasn't the highest offer based upon um, what they might want to use the property for, you can certainly do that, provided you have those two appraisers that come in and say it's um, um, higher than you'd get at a public auction. It's fair and reasonable. So 
Any questions? No, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and item 8.7, uh, the superintendent report, Mrs. Finian. All right, so this month is Love the Bus Month. Wave to our drivers. Thank them for taking our kids safely to um, schools. Uh, just a reminder. Also, you heard the high school students mention school counselor week, the 6th to the 10th. So our school counselors, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Bove, Mr. Dorward at the middle school, Mrs. Hill Bodie at the elementary school, uh, Mrs. Moyer at the high school. You heard the students also talk about the senior breakfast. Um, it was a really nice event organized by the class advisors. Um, the students just, it was, it, was a lo it was long, it was almost an hour and the students were riveted to that video and lots of great food. Nice to see them hanging out. Watch for more uh, photos in the community update. Um, just a reminder, because we did not have any snow days uh, prior to February 1st, we will be closed on February 17th, as well as Monday, February 20th. Random, <laughs> no, we're still closed. No matter, we could have a snowstorm tonight, and we're still to close those days. <laughs> Um, Random Acts of Kindness Day is February 17th, and Random Acts of Kindness Week is um, next week. So just re a reminder, shout out to our community, our colleagues, you know, share a nice compliment or some kind words with a friend, Random Acts of Kindness, um, you know, send a nice note to your child's teacher or paraprofessional, um, just a little extra kindness. We can we can all use some of that. Um, just a reminder: we have our concert scheduled Tuesday, May second, and uh, May eighteenth at the middle school, and then our K to twelve art show, which is being planned by our arts, uh, visual and performing arts department, Tuesday, May 9th. Uh, we also have our published Keystone and PSSA. Uh, testing dates, it's really important that all of our students uh, take the test to ensure that um, we meet the threshold which is required for the 95% partic participation. Um, also at the end of our board meetings uh, agendas, you'll see a variety of other content um, that our community members might be interested in reading, so they are there and they're public if you want to know how many kids are in the school or classrooms. Uh, minutes from our um, partners at LCTI, LTRI-C, um, some in additional information from the Charter Middle School um, as well. Can I ask you one question? You sure may. On the enrollment report, mm -hmm. it's dated January 2022. I don't know if that's the wrong year or you're giving us enrollment from last January? I don't know either. Okay. We'll check it. <laughs> we'll check it. Thank you. Um, current job op job openings, we um, are still looking for a full-time certified school nurse, a coordinator of human resources. We have, op we have plenty of uh, availability for instructional assistants and substitutes are um, very much needed for teachers and nurses and also instructional assistance. And that's all I have. All right. Um, next item is uh, our new item that we added. It's 9.1, and that is going to be nominating a, a representative for a new term starting uh, July 1, 2023 for the Carbon Lehigh Intermedi Intermediary Unit. I always have a hard time with that one. Um, and uh, so at that point, at this point, I would like to nominate uh, Mrs. McKelvey, who's been serving on that uh, as that rep. Um, can I get a second for that nomination? Second. Uh, any questions or comments? I think she does a wonderful job, but what's the term on that? It is a three-year term. So that, so yes, this, so, so Mrs. McKelvey was, was serving a, a, a previous term that was, that is ending at the end of this school year. Uh, and so we need to go forward with a new nomination. Um, with that, I will uh, ask for everyone to vote uh, yay or nay on this. Do, is everyone a, in agreement for Mrs. McKelvey as our representative? All, all in agreement? All. Yay. Yay. Aye. Yay. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Laura, maybe? Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Um, do we have any citizens' comments? No. Nope. All right. And... 
as Mrs. Feeney Hatton just noted, we do have uh, a section of additional reports. And uh, I want to note that the, uh, the honor roll is listed on this, this month's um, list for SHS. If we had more time, I would sit here and read the names because I think that's super important. Maybe next time I will do that if we have, but I think we're, we're out of time here. Um, with that, I will note that our next meeting is March 22nd for the next board meeting and also the curriculum and technology meeting. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I moved. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone at home. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody.